art of the California State Day and took over the deaf in Philly. And uh, I've been teaching since 2005. I was teaching social studies, but then I decided, you know, really what I need to be teaching is art. And about uh, with my students, I explored the idea of deaf art. Okay, and then. Um, and then I also explored with my students these famous to be artists who have their own businesses in art. Um, and I wanted to expose my students to the deaf experience. I'm Ellen Mansfield, and I'm from Maryland. I grew up actually in New York City. And how you doing? Well, you know, from the time I was little, really I started at a very early age doing artistic projects, and my parents encouraged me a lot with that. They always gave me the encouragement I needed to create art. I did attend art school in New York City. I went to the School for Visual Arts for my BFA. And then I also did a minor in women's studies. And just recently, uh, they started a class on women artists and the artwork and expression by women uh, from a feminist perspective. I saw that and it really hit me about deaf identity and how that may pertain to it. So it got me kind of wondering, but I didn't do much with it. Then I went to Maryland. And while I was in Maryland, it was really the D.C. area that I saw people starting to have the conversation about what deaf art might be and what the DeVito might be. And I moved to Maryland in uh, 1995. So around that time is when I started to get the motivation and the momentum going. And 1989 is when DeVito really got going, of course, as you know, and all the experimentation that occurred at that time. I have two grown children. And so I kind of had taken myself out of the business world, and I was working as a full-time mom. And then about three or four years ago, my children had attained adulthood, they left the nest, and then I really started expressing myself through art in a different way. So it's really wonderful to be able to do that and meet so many deaf people with similar experiences. You know, a lot of people feel ashamed about the deaf experience, and they feel alone, but when you find you have these commonalities and the universal experiences we all share, it's very healing, and I see Davia as a wonderful... I started doing art when I was six. I started to via art in 2009. From then on, I became a truly deaf Washington. Now, I was actually an artist before I was born. You might not know this, but I was actually drawing on my mother's womb. I was drawing on the walls of my mother's womb. That's true. So basically in my family, uh, DNA, you might say. It's in our genes. Art's just come down through all of us. And uh, basically, uh, it was in me and ready to, ready to come out when I came out. I was mainstreamed all my life until I went to Gallaudet. And then I majored in art while I was a student there. I was one of the founding members of the DAM. D DAM. The DAM, which is the Deaf Artists Movement. That was 20 years actually before the Devia particular movement. And so now uh, we see with about the 25 years plus the 20, we have about 45 years of Devia really celebrating. This is actually the, the 25th celebration of the one from 1989, but I was about 20 years earlier. I create lots of different art, uh, but mostly I, my metier is deaf uh, graphic design. This is Mark Van Menon. Excuse me, Jim Van Menon. And I met him 2011. in 2011. And we did silver, we became the Silver Moon brand, which is a kind of business we did together to create work collaboratively. And he wrote a book about life as a deaf artist and the work and the things that we create. And he just finished a book also about Nancy Bork, which you'll find over there at the table for you to peruse. And that's me. I'm so excited to see you all. In 95. I think I met or I saw Betty G. Miller in uh, Gallaudet at one time. I, I worked at Gallaudet. And that was the first time they had heard about Divya. So I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And so I started making clay figures, working in ceramics to express my own experience related to growing up in a deaf family. And at that time, you know, I was fully hearing at that time and had been for several years. But then about five years ago, I started losing hearing in my in my right ear. And so now I'd say I'm partly deaf in one ear and 
deaf in the other. So anyway, the art that I was making at that time changed. And uh, I did some acrylic painting and I experimented with different media. And I also tried to incorporate ASL themes, Divya themes in my art. I just started with that. I was didn't have any training in art. I've been trained in other fields and other disciplines. I've learned something about art, but really I'm a self-taught. Um, I, I do some computer art. I do, um, if a college a offers free courses in different kinds of media, I will do that. Um, since 91. And then one of my favorite artists happened to be Ann Silver. I mean, I like all of these people, but I never had met her. Uh, but in 2011, I went to a conference and s one of my friends uh, suggested, suggested that we The title of this work is Destiny, um, and you know the idea of mother of all spirits, and you know a lot of times when mothers find that their child is deaf, they, they don't want the child, they want to abort the child, but having the child is just a natural process of life, and it doesn't matter whether the child is deaf or hearing, the important thing is it's born healthy. I think. And in Africa and Asia and all kinds of places, people have traveled and done journeys to get to a new place. And when they work and reach these frontier, they see a bright shining light in front of them as if they're going to the new place that they're going to set, set up their lives. So this is actually reference to Martha's Vineyard because for Martha's Vineyard, that's basically where the, our goddess, American Sign Language, kind of came from. So the rather fecund and fertile looking woman is showing the birth of the language and the culture being able to thread. If we look at mothers usually symbolize wisdom and fertility and our goddesses usually represent those sorts of um, personality traits. So I try to infuse all my art with some sort of spirituality. You know, there's one called the silent scream which you can see back at my table that yes, there's a sign for pa. Like when you get to the land, the promised land, whatever, there's a big sign for pa, or at last, or finally. There's another one I've created that has that, <coughs> with a lot of colors in it, and that's also uh, showing that the mother of all death souls is there, and has kind of raised her spirit among us. Now this one I w is in homage to Betty G. Miller because I saw that she's one of the founders of Devia, and um, when I was exposed to her, um, you know, she had a very famous piece called Bell School, <coughs> um, and, and that... So glad you have this piece. So I saw this piece, and it really struck me. Their pain reminded me of my own experience with oralism being beat on the hand for using sign language, so I could really relate to it. And then I decided to make my own tribute to Betty G. Miller. I think this is a new day. Here we are in 2014, and things are just the same. Maybe not even just the same, they're actually worse. Now we take a deaf child, and we, in vitro, we, we do all kinds of mechanical things. We test them in vitro to see if they're deaf. It's very and so it's, it's very sad, not to mention all of the devices that we have that are intended to sort of destroy us. And so I think through art, we need to advocate for ourselves and our deafhood. So 70 years later, 1944 to 2014, there's been no improvement in the education of deaf. We're back to where we were before. And I know this is a sad and painful message, but notice the hourglass that I put there and this is to indicate that the deaf community is running out of time and that we that oralism took over and retains control all the way to the cochlear implants and hearing aids and unless you do something this is my message that things This is made with ceramic tile. 
you know, architects, um, peop- public places, often churches, temples, oftentimes depict the history of their people and stories from the past in tile. But I had not seen this in, in terms of deaf history. So I imagined that we would tell the history of deaf people in tiles and that we would continue our traditions through deaf culture so that there would be statues of deaf people out in the public and so forth. Now this is sort of a small first step. It is called a mandala, which is an Indian um, Indian art uh, technique and it's used in meditation and spirituality. It's not religion as much as spirituality uh, because before Um, There hadn't been anything depicting deaf spirituality, I didn't think. Sometimes there are figures with hands as wings and so forth. And so I used all of these images. And and also there will be a candle image in the hand as well. So you can see the surrounding images are all images related to hands and sign language. And also, this is to predict people of, of diverse people. And that's the second tier. This is, and it's also a tribute to Native Americans. Now, I'm Jewish, so I also wanted to incorporate uh, the menorah with, this, with the feeling of thanksgiving and the celebration of Native Americans, the gratitude. Because you know that the Americans were decimated. I mean, the Native Americans were decimated in here. Uh, and were treated as less than human, second class, which is the deaf experience as well. So, so there is a, a tribute to the Native Americans in there as well. Then I thought, what else? Well, I want to show the blue sky because that's very important to Native Americans. They're out outside a lot. Also, the triangle shape is evocative of the deep the teepee, which is very important in their culture. But I really wanted to emphasize in deaf art the idea that the pyramid is important to us as well because it, because it represents strength and communication. And I, I thought, and maybe have you seen the mural? Of the, the Devia mural and then the updated Devia mural, the the old one that was made 25 years ago, that that mural had a pyramid as as a central part of it, and as did the updated mural. Now, I also have the Tree of Life shown in here, and I'm also wearing a piece that has that. The Tree of Life is to show the eternity of the Earth, and I thought, now what color should I use for the tree? Um, you know, you normally trees are shown as brown and so forth. So I googled, and I found that the Native Americans have a very famous story about the rainbow. And it is to emphasize appreciation of diversity. So I thought, what better to um, to do than to do the story of the rainbow to show the rainbow, which is uh, recognition of diversity. The re- In brief, the story of the rainbow is that all the colors were fighting to each other, and then the storm gods said, no, you all have to get along together, and you're all equally important. And then the very small white part in the very beginning, which is in the shape of of, uh, of a heart, that shows my love of deaf children and their right to have sign language. I do a lot of portraits, self-portraits. And there are many famous hearing art artists who also do famous self-portraits. But I felt like it was really important to show my deaf identity in my self-portrait. So I thought that I would do, uh, I would represent some of my art from my development as an artist, and so I made copies of all of those to show my experience in the development of my deaf identity. 
So a lot of this is older, uh, older work of mine. But now, how to, how to represent deaf pride? Well, I wanted to include my two deaf daughters. And also, let me see if I have the right spelling of the name. This whole thing is actually a tribute to Clayton Valley as well. Be- he is the, the famous poet. You know Clayton Valley, right? V-A-L-L-I. V-A-L-L-I. Am I spelling it right? Okay. So he has that famous ASL poem about dandelions. So where do you suppose I am in this picture? Right in, in the middle. middle. And why? Middle. I am a mom. But how do you know it's me? What I see is that I have become the seed. I have given birth to my two girls who are yellow, which is, again, a reference to the dandelion poem. Can you see the stems on the two figures of my daughters? And they represent amorphosis. You know that when a caterpillar, after a caterpillar is born, at some point in his life... you're talking about, right? Yes, yes. Right. (laughs) Yes. So a caterpillar at some point in his life goes through a huge change and they become a butterfly. Now, we're humans. We don't have the ability to make cocoons and change ourselves. But deaf people have a a similar experience in that we grow up forced to be oral, and then we have to make our own metamorphosis into into being ASL users and into being proud members of the deaf community. And so I thought a lot about um, analyzing different pieces of art. And actually, one of my greatest influences is from Frida Kahlo. She's a Mexican and Jewish artist which was surprising to me. And she is very strong. Um, She has a strong use of self-portrait. She's done many, many, many. I'm so sorry that it, my husband isn't in this picture. I suppose I should insert him somewhere into the picture. But but I, I, to try to make him fit in with the whole dandelion metaphor, be, it just wasn't working because really this is an analysis of my journey, but I suppose in the end I I want to talk a little bit about what these colors represent, the colors that I tend to use most often. Red is power and yellow is hope and the light of deaf people. And we need that hope. We need to see that light and illumination. I have two different blues, one dark blue, which symbolizes oppression, and the lighter blue hue is more about deafhood. Black and white really doesn't have much symbolic meaning behind it. It's more I'm showing reinforcement of the other colors, and it makes them pop out more when you outline with either black or white. So they're basically to make the other ones stand out more. So it's a round table. This is taken from Patty Ladd's book. Deaf, in search of deafhood, a deaf culture in search of deafhood. And it refers to the idea of subaltern resistance and discussion about that. Now, people end up arguing quite often. You can see there's a lot of heated debate going on in this picture, it's kind of like at each other's throats. It's kind of interesting. What's going on there, you might wonder? There's a hidden message in this. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a lot of concentric circles that are sort of hidden within it. Tell us what the hidden message is. You've got to tell us. Where is it? I can't see it. You won't? (laughs) Well. This actually is a self-portrait. Now, I have to admit, I've never really been fond of painting self-portraits. I have done them before, but, you know, there there I am just staring out at myself, and it feels kind of funny. So I thought, how am I going to do one if I really want to do an interesting one? So I came up with the idea of a dot-to-dot, meaning that what you have to do is figure out what it looks like. You do the work to connect the dots.
So it goes 1 to 48. 1 to 48. But within this painting as well, there are four symbols. And I wonder if you can pick them out, maybe? Yep, you do see that stand, the sign for stand. This is really about my childhood and my journey up to where I'm at now, where I stand now, literally and figuratively. I'm very big proponent of artivism, and I am what you call an artivist, an art activist. So that sign, stand, is uh, reminiscent of that. And then you see hands with blue tape on them. And that basically is showing the oppression of having to go through oral school and have your hands whacked for signing because signs were forbidden, of course. They were very strict. I went to a very strict oral school. There's another hand in sort of a death power salute. And that shows the struggles that we finally overcome. Finally, we're out of that oppressive environment. We're able to move forward. I'm able to go on my journey and become more of who I am. See anything else? See any other symbols? There's a fourth one. There's an elephant, actually. There's an elephant. Over on the left-hand side, the top left, can you see the elephant? That represents A.G. Bell. And the real purpose of this elephant, it's like the elephant in the room, if you're familiar with that. OK. Now, I've kind of got this idea from Ella Mae Lentz, if you're familiar with her. She tells the story of the elephant in the deaf room. OK, and I'm basically paying homage to that. So the elephant in the room. Now, I'm in the room. I'm in the room, and sometimes, as I grew up, I was under the auspices of A.G. Bell and his whole paradigm, but not anymore. That's it. Thank you. I did that piece in 1999. I almost said 1899, but no, that would have been a great mistake. <laughs> that would have been 100 years previous to this. But what I'm trying to say here is there's been a big change in the terminology and in the labels given to us deaf people and to deaf children and so forth, uh, given to us by hearing society. They've been horribly negative um, labels that have been given to deaf people through the ages. And each one of the crayons has a label. I'm not so sure. Can we get any closer I than this? I don't think we can get close-ups on All right. Well, you'll be able to see it in the gallery. You can get But some of them are dummy, lip reader. I see deaf and dumb. Deaf and dumb. Hearing impaired. Handicapped. Oralist. Oralist. Deaf mute. Deaf mute, yep. And freak. Because all of these things were things that were hurled at me. I was called a freak when I was in the mainstream school. And I thought that was just a normal name that people would call each other. N little did I realize till later that it was a very negative term. Then I, then the other box of crayons. Um, now, of course, the the, the uh, name hearing impaired wasn't wasn't thought up 100 years ago. So I've taken a little liberty with uh, the exact year that each one of these terms came into being. Um, it might have been, I think, more like 1970s that hearing impaired came on the scene. But now we see an update update to the more uh, acceptable terms to us. Coda. Seeing, deaf blind, late hard deaf oh, American deaf American was still blurry to me. Hard and signer and then deaf. So now do you all understand what that term is, coda? How many people here don't know what coda is? Yeah, child of deaf parents, right. And he is a coda. Jim is a coda. I felt that it was really important to include CODA in the new terminology because CODAs are part of the deaf community. 
Um, but they haven't been necessarily considered part of deaf culture. There's been a lot of resistance to that. But I think that's ridiculous. He grew up in a deaf family. His first language was ASL. My first language wasn't ASL. I was, actually, I say art was my first language. But then I suppose you could say s my second language was English. And I didn't learn ASL till much later. So really, in a way, I'm trilingual. Art, English, and ASL. Now, do you see the second crayon? It says seeing. Well, during the deaf art movement, DAM, we got together to talk about what deaf art was. And one of the people there said, why don't we change the terminology from deaf to seeing? Because if we say hearing, then why don't we say that the counterpart to hearing is seeing? Hearing people use their ears, deaf people use their eyes to receive the same information. So, so we tried to uh, push that as a term to be used, but it just sort of never worked out. It sort of faded away, and it was never accepted by the general public. But I also want to say that this is in honor of John Darcy Smith. He was a member of the original deaf artist movement. He's passed away now. But I did that in a special tribute to him because he was the one who proposed that term, seeing. Now, hearing people come to me and say, wow, I, we, we didn't know that those terms were not appropriate. So, um, so I do see a change. I think okay. this one um, is just an, was drawn on an envelope. It's supposed to be like a, a stamp, an idea for a stamp. Well, it's been popular since the 40s. Artists like to create, uh, like to decorate their envelopes to make them look like stamps or whatever. S and they use those to send to their friends and family and so forth. So I was greatly in influenced by that when I was a child. And I saw that and thought, wow, I want to do something like that. But I want to add deaf art themes to it. And I'd say maybe I've done 2,000 different envelopes and used. First of all, it was just uh, a few select people, my family only. And then when I went to Gallaudet during those years, I, I went nuts and sent tons of them. And my mother has kept them all. And then some of my friends saw them and wanted me to create those envelopes for them too. And so I said, OK, I'm setting up a new rule. In order for me to do that for you, you have to write me first, and then I'll send you a letter back. That sort of cut down on the number of requests that I had, because I made that requirement. So if you can see, it, it is in the shape of an envelope. Imagine that this comes down here. I would put the address on the bottom. But I don't want to show that now, because I, I want to perfect her privacy. So, And I used real stamps on the envelope to create the image. And of course, the post office must have <laughs> thought I was nuts. And they stamped every single one of them with their, with their um, seal. And also, sometimes post office couldn't find the address on the envelope. And so I know I caused havoc in the post office. And then when I got to the, um, the letter carrier, I know. Each person along the way had to figure it out. First, it would get to the city, then would it go to the count, to the count, the district, and then to the street, and then hopefully the right person would be able to. And they gave me hell it. about this. The post office gave me hell about this. I mean, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They would sort of stamp it and send it along, and then it would come back to me, and, and marked as there's no such address, and then I would write it clearer. And so then I finally resorted to putting an old-fashioned label on it, and they could, because. Uh, when they stamped all of the stamps that I had on there, it created a mess. It destroyed the image. So I thought, oh, yeah, OK. Now, Jim, when he was working on the book on me and interviewing me, he got um, photographs of all of my work. And so I wanted to ask my friends, whom I had sent those envelopes to, if we could have pictures of them. And most of them said that they had thrown them out. And I'm talking 200, 300 envelopes. My mother didn't even keep them. And some of them had been destroyed. They got wet. And so, so it, was, it was horrible to see that so many of them had been destroyed. But there are a few photographs of those envelopes in his book. Well, I guess, um, I guess now, because in our time of technology, nobody writes letters anymore. But I think 
this is sort of like the counterpart to Facebook. This is, this is way before your time. Two chimneys, actually. They're chimneys. Because uh, we don't hear sound, they're supposed to symbolize uh, the importance of, um, <laughs> really, r the idea here is that the stamp is a way to show freedom in, in a democratic government. But so what I'm saying is, where's our freedom? Where is a deaf person's freedom to speak out? And in the book, um, we couldn't reproduce my art with real stamps because the U.S. Post Office wouldn't allow it. So we, we don't have it in the book with real stamps. And so what we did is sort of create our own uh, facsimile of a deaf stamp. And, and we should have done that a long Bowman? Are you talking about Bowman? Oh, Dirksen, yes. That's the, I was trying to think of the guy's name, Dirksen, yeah. Dirksen Bauman and, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul Times Jr. Dirksen Bauman and had come up with the concept of having something, deaf gain, that we add something to society, that it, without us being here, something would be lost. Without deaf presence, we would somehow be diminished. So trying to help fix deaf people doesn't necessarily fix society. That deaf people, as they are, contribute to society and help people's understanding in more of a global sense. It adds to diversity and richness. And there's so many other positive aspects of deafness. Uh, and that it actually contributes and enriches society. So we wanted to reinterpret that in pictures somehow, some sort of image. And so Anne and I went back and forth about it. And of course, she loves road signs as a motif. She has several pieces. Uh, so after we met, we were talking more about the idea of using road signs in our work and continuing with uh, a motif that's been very successful graphic design for her. So we had the idea of hearing loss and deaf gain. Right? But we have them on the same sign. Right? So which way do you want to go? Pick this one. This is a periodic table of deaf culture. Now, the idea is what if there were no hearing people? Right? What would it be like? What would be the important aspects of deaf community and deaf culture that would stand out the most and be the most um, extant for us all? And so what are the elements, what are the basic essence of us all? So this was the, uh, cons the inception of the idea to come up for. We try to describe all the different elements, all the different parts that create a deaf essence, all the parts of community. So we started in the middle with the deaf community. Now the yellow, well, you know, like you said, these colors aren't really as vibrant as they are when you see it in person. but. Uh, if you look at the color key, you'll see we have history, we have deaf blind in there, we have hard of hearing, we have late deafened, and we have coda. Okay, so six, no, excuse me, five. Five different squares in that color who represent people who grow up with ASL or somehow are very much involved and uh, encapsulated within the deaf community. And other people are able to join in that circle and be in the hinterlands of that, but that's the core. And then the language particular area talks about, it speaks to values and the elements that are part of the values and language. Basically, that's part of the core being, too. Then we go outwards from the center to organizations. <coughs> you know, we have our, OK, Gallaudet, GU, that's right up there. G I don't think so. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, we both have so many degrees from Gallaudet that we had to put it first. but. You know, it's a little older than the RIT. Anyway, so we put all this together, all the different elements, and it all comes together in this table. And basically, all of it together creates the holistic idea of the deaf community. When I interviewed Anne several years ago, she said that the concept of this came about that if you look every day uh, throughout the year, and of course, you will understand everything, right? That's including the idea of deaf community. People sometimes misunderstand, and they say, there's no bad things involved, is this all positive? You know, and do you have to know the story behind every single one? But as you 